Hello and welcome to Bread Theory. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with me, I'm Zach. I, I do a theory uh, stream every Friday night at 7 p.m. St uh, Central Standard Time. And uh, we had just finished up last week, uh, this, this very last Friday, uh, doing the Principles of Communism from Friedrich Engels. But tonight, we are continuing on in, our, in my series of uh, videos about uh, introducing you to the world of permaculture. Uh, it's, it's one of the most important uh, philosophies that, that I believe have been developed in the past, well, 50 years now. It's, it's, uh, yeah, it's coming up on, on pretty close to having been around for about 50 years. started in the late 70s uh, by Bill Mollison, uh, who was a professor in Tasmania at the University of Tasmania. And him and his uh, research assistant, um, David Holmgren, came up with these uh, ideas. They, they started with the, the ethics, uh, care for the earth, care for people, and return the surplus to the service of the first two, as well as uh, set limits to growth. Um, so that, that third ethic has also been kind of uh, rebranded as fair share, and I, I think that works just fine as well. And, and it's one reason that I think permaculture is so applicable to some of the other leftist theories that, that we've been talking about, because it talks about returning of surplus to, it doesn't say to make a profit necessarily. It doesn't say, uh, you know, anything about uh, coercion or force either. It's, it's, it's about uh, just, to, to me, it's about giving mutual aid, you know, saying I have extra of this, I see a need here, so I'm going to fill it and uh, not necessarily expect anything in return other than the satisfaction that I've helped out someone in my community. So I, I think that's uh, one reason why it's, it's really important that we learn about not just the, the, the general leftist theories of anarchy, communism, socialism, what have you, but, but also these theories that, that think more about the long term, you know, uh, thinking, thinking more about uh, the long-term viability of a of a culture, really. Uh, one one of the definitions of permaculture is is permanent culture, uh, as well as permanent agriculture. But the idea is to be able to just keep on doing the same thing with without diminishing the the future generations' ability to continue and and thrive as well. And and in fact, with permaculture, we can go a step beyond just baseline survival and, and maintenance and and get towards regeneration towards uh, becoming more entwined with the, the local ecosystems that, that we depend on, you know, helping to be co-creators in those ecosystems. So I, I, try, to I try to fold in permaculture ideas to uh, leftist theory whenever I can. And uh, I think we can go in the other opposite direction as well and, and try and bring these leftist ideas more front and center into permaculture. There definitely is a tendency among a lot of practitioners of permaculture to want to, it's, it's kind of the, I'd like to live out in the middle of nowhere, not be bothered by anyone, not have to think about politics, not have to think about anything, just, you know, protect me and mine, that, that sort of mentality, which is understandable. Things can get overwhelming. Things can get frustrating. It's difficult to live with other people, especially uh, when, when uh, there can be so much information flying at you all at once. It's hard to you know, know what to think at any given time. Um, politics themselves can become so complicated. Uh, it, it's an understandable impulse. At the same time, people are, you know, human beings are a communal species. We, we do our best when we work together. We do our best when we have strong, interdependent communities. So that may be nice if you are able to go out and live by yourself. Um, but it's not necessarily going to be good for the long-term viability of, of any sort of system. And just because you're out there by yourself uh, right now doesn't mean that some other regime might come in and say, well, this is no longer your land. We're going to shift everything around. I mean, that's definitely happened on, on the continent of North America. Um, there's no reason it couldn't happen again in the future. So I think it's important, even if you don't like it, to uh, be involved in, in community and, and political life and, and not just turn your, your back on everything. So 
that's th those are the ideas I'd like to bring into permaculture as we go along. Um, and so let's let's go over to now the videos. Um, so let's scroll down here just a little bit and we can look at where we've been so far. We've been going through this series by Andrew Millison, who is a professor at Oregon State University. Let me just check and see if you guys can see that well. Ah, well enough. Maybe we'll pull out even more. Uh, he's also a permaculture practitioner. I don't know if he's written any books or anything. In fact, why don't we take a look right now? That's a good question. Let's get a little more about Andrew Millison himself. Oh, he's part of the College of Agricultural Sciences at Oregon State University. Hmm, what should we check out first? He definitely has a really cool YouTube channel. Talks about all kinds of cool stuff, goes very in depth into permaculture. And you can see he's trying to apply it to uh, the urban settings as well. We have urban drought solutions, which, you know, considering how bad the drought has been in, in many parts of the world this, this summer, definitely going to become more and more important. Uh, water may become a scarce commodity, especially since, for the most part, especially with larger cities, uh, they're draining the aquifers that they, they sit on, or they tend to drain the aquifers that they sit upon or rely on faster than they are recharging. So at some point, you, you know, drilling deeper and deeper wells is not going to cut it. There's just not going to be enough of a supply coming in. So what do you do at that point? Well, if you, if you think about wise water use, if you think about things like perhaps gray water cycling, which is taking wastewater from not from not from toilets, but from like showers, sinks, dishwashers, that sort of thing, stuff that's not contaminated with with human waste, but just like food waste and stuff like that. That's known as gray water. So we could cycle that into systems where we remove the solids and, and keep the water and use that water to uh, water vegetation. Uh, irrigate urban crops, um, put it into areas where it can percolate down into that, that, that aquifer again. Uh, wetlands tend to be good at, at aquifer recharge. So that, that's, that's cool that he's talking about these sorts of things. Let's see what else we can find out about him. So this is permaculturerising.com. All right, so he's been studying, teaching, and practicing permaculture since he took his first design course in 1996. Started teaching permaculture at the college level in 2001 and has been an instructor at OSU in the horticulture department since 2009. He first learned of permaculture in the drylands where he studied at Prescott College for his undergraduate and master's degrees in Arizona. His focus was on rainwater harvesting, gray water systems, and desert agriculture. So a lot of stuff about water use. That's, that's really important stuff. Um, you know, the, 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 the phrase water is life is not just a, a hippy-dippy sort of cliche. It, it literally is true. Any civilization that has not had access to clean, uh, you know, potable water has ended up perishing. That, that, that's one of the key things that, that every civilization needs. And now so more than ever, since water is used in so much more than just drinking and bathing and, and washing things, it's, it's used in industrial processes. It's used in fracking. I mean, there's, there's lots of places that that water goes that it didn't used to, and a lot more demand on it. All right, continuing on, he started a permaculture landscape, and he started a permaculture landscape design and build company, and also worked in an ecologically based landscape architecture firm. In recent years, Andrew's focus has been more on design for climate change, resilience, broad scale water management for farm and development planning, permaculture housing develop, uh, developments, and Oregon water law for obtaining water rights. All very important stuff. Andrew has developed a successful online permaculture program through OSU, and in recent years moved into media production, uh, which what I, I think that's alluding to his videos that he does, uh, traveling internationally to film and produce educational content focused on permaculture-based food and water systems. He's most well known for his YouTube video series, India's Water Revolution. Oh, maybe we'll get to that at some point. Uh, so he's got some other stuff. Oh, he's got a podcast as well. 
Oh, yes, I actually, I think I do follow that podcast, the EarthRepairRadio.com. I'll end up putting that in the show notes as well. If you are watching this on YouTube or listening to it as a podcast, uh, he's got a YouTube channel. I'll definitely put that up. And we'll put his instructor page at OSU up as well. So, pretty knowledgeable guy talking about issues that are, are really key to the human flourishing and survival, really. You know, like, like I said, water is only going to become more and more important. And we see that now with uh, the devastation from wildfire, wildfires that just keeps getting, it seems to be getting worse and worse every year. Um, and these, I mean, definitely we've had record droughts in, in many parts of North America record early droughts as well, uh, record heat waves. And yeah, I mean, these, these uh, stresses are not just experienced in the US, it's, it's around the world at this point. We are in the middle of climate change. There's, there's just no two ways about it. Mm, let's see now. Anyway, thanks for the follow. I definitely appreciate it. And, and I hope you've come to, to learn about permaculture. And if you have any questions tonight, definitely let me know. I'm always happy to to answer whatever I can. Oh, let's see. Actually, no, that would be... Oh, wait a minute. Unvaccinated subhuman. Okay. Not sure what an angle you're coming from that from, but uh, welcome nonetheless. Hopefully, at least permaculture is something that you find interesting, because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. All right. I think at this point, we should probably get into the videos themselves. So we're going to learn now about permaculture design for water, and, and I, I, I'm assuming he's going to have a lot to say about this one being his primary focus. Water. Design for water is the bones of any permaculture system, and oftentimes the way the layout works with water determines the basic shape of things. Remember our permaculture principles, which tell us to observe and interact, and design from patterns to details. Our powers of observation and our ability to see the patterns of water flow need to be developed before we can design for water on our sites. A water supply represents potential, the potential for people to drink, wash and cook, the potential for irrigating crops, the potential to generate electricity the potential to raise fish, and the potential to grow a forest. So the first rule of working with water is to keep it in its place of highest potential in the landscape, up high. For a house, the roof represents the place with the highest potential. With the right roofing materials, clean water can be had and directed into a storage tank for later use. It never touches the ground, so remains clean. It can flow by the force of gravity and be directed to where you want it. The side. One note on that. Um, there is the question of whether or not it's a good idea to use uh, water that you catch from your roof if you happen to have an asphalt shingle roof. Uh, there's definitely petrochemicals that over time will, will leach from a, an asphalt shingle roof and could potentially get into the plants that you grow. So there's a lot of, there's, I wouldn't say a lot of, but there is debate about whether or not that's, that's safe. If you really want to be safe though, you can go towards a stainless steel roof or a slate roof. I think slate is, is what they say is the, the most inert uh, material that, that is commonly used for roofing. It's also going to give you a lot more fire protection than, than a, uh, asphalt shingle, and, and the same is true of the stainless steel. You can use tin, tin as well, and, I, and I'm not sure of any problems health-wise related to tin, but, but definitely look into that before you try something like that. Um, beyond that, uh, there's also the possibility of using what's known as a green roof, where you have uh, a, a thin layer of soil that you put down. You still have to have some sort of impervious material, so you need to be careful about what you use for that. But you, you put a, a thin layer of soil uh, above that, and then you plant right into that. Usually very low-growing stuff, uh, such as uh, succulents of, of one kind or another. 
Uh, Sedum is, is a very popular one. I, I maintain a number of roofs like that. Doing landscaping, which is my primary job right now. Uh, so yeah, just, just a note, be careful. And and also with, with your water catchment system, be careful the the materials you use there. You want to definitely use food grade stuff. You need to look for food grade materials to, to store your water in. And if it's plastic, even if it is food grade materials, just know that it's still going to leach some sort of chemicals that may not be good for your health over the course of its lifetime. It's just going to be low enough that it's rated food safe, right? So according to probably the EPA, uh, I don't know if it's the EPA or the Food and Drug Administration who would regulate that, but according to whatever government industry or, or government organization deals with that sort of thing, it never leaches enough to cause noticeable harm statistically. But just something to look out for. The ends of a roof are like the slopes of a mountain. When we think of keeping water in its place of highest potential in the landscape at this scale, we think first about covering bare ground with plants and making the soil able to absorb water. Next, we think about places where we can safely intercept the flow of water with the least amount of effort and damage. On damaged land, we may need to do some surgery to get the water to slow down. This may take the form of a swale or a ditch to intercept its water on the way down a slope and soak it more into the soil, or direct it into ponds or reservoirs. This is what we can see on a large scale at the Albeda project. And remember, when you're catching water, whether it's just a, a rain barrel, or whether you're catching it in a ditch or a pond or whatever, that is, that is the embodiment of, of one of the key principles of permaculture, according to David Holmgren, that being catch and store energy. That, I mean, that, that water being held up high, that definitely literally holds potential energy because as, as soon as you give it a path, it will flow downhill and, and it can do work for you. Uh, you know, especially if you're not wanting to pump as much water or rely on a pump at all it's a real great idea to set that water up higher than where, where you need it. Um, and then even with the ponds, that, that catching and store energy, uh, it slowly will, will push water into the, the subsoil uh, and kind of even out the, the rainfall and, and drought patterns. So never gets quite as dry in a drought, never gets quite as, as wet and deluge um, to the point where most water is running off. As it, as it normally would in a downpour. In Saudi Arabia. I'll show you some photos of that. When we soak water high up in the watershed. And look at how arid and, and I would even say desolate this landscape looks. You know, and there's a little bit of green you can see start coming in, but imagine how it was before all of these, these rock dams were set up. All he's doing here is slowing down that water a little bit and allowing it to sink underneath the soil. Especially in very parched, arid environments, things can get very, you know, compacted in. You know, things dry out and you, you'll see like the, the top of the soil cracking apart because things are, are, are there's just not enough water to, to keep it out and expanded. And one of the, the compounding problems with that is that the water will tend to just sheet right off. It, it has much less ability to penetrate down into the soil unless you create these these little dams and give it more time and eventually it then will work its way into the soil and then over time as as you go along as the that that band of water underneath the soil continues to be filled up you're going to have topsoil that that you know can expand out a, a little bit more again as well as there being moisture below the surface for roots of your plants to reach down into. So this is, this is also bringing into play small and slow solutions. This is a very small thing to do, to just put a bunch of rocks across the, the slope of a hill, but it can have huge effects in the long term, and it, and it will keep compounding on itself the longer that you allow it to be in place, and, and the longer you maintain that system to function as it does. So. Let's continue on though and see what he says. It still moves down, but percolates underground through the soil, slowly replenishing water tables and feeding streams down below. Slowly sinking and spreading the water 
so it has more surface area contact with the earth will allow time for soils to become deeply saturated. And just imagine, if you can do something like this, if you can make these arid, you know, very rugged desert environments start to bloom, start to be more or less arable land that you can get a, a yield from, there's another permaculture principle, it'd be an, obtain a yield. But if you can get it to that point in these very extreme climates with, with heat and, and dryness, Imagine what you can do in just your average, you know, Midwestern backyard or your average temperate climate forest area, you know. That's one reason that these, these uh, permaculture designers like to go to these very dry and arid places is because it, it, it shows proof of concept. It's, it's like we're going to put permaculture through the most extreme uh, conditions and, and, and uh, obstacles to overcome. And if it can prove itself there, then no one can say, oh, yeah, well, it works really well as long as you got a lot of water. Well, no, 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 because look, we, we've proven now that it works even when you don't have a lot of water. I've heard of, of projects in Spain. There are parts of Spain that get, I think it was something like seven inches of rain a year, and, and that's it. And they, and they tend to come basically all at once um, in very short bursts. And they've managed through just smart water management to get these areas to start reblooming. And if enough areas do that, we talked in an earlier video about the conveyor belt effect that, that trees have on the landscape, where a tree sucks up water, it, um, it then takes it, it, it uh, keeps it from just running off into a ditch. It, it uses the water and then it evapotranspirates out of its, its tips of its leaves that creates another you know enough trees together doing that all at the same time creates rain clouds further inland that then rain down and provide more of an area for or it it, it produces conditions for more trees to, to start sprouting and growing so even in arid lands if we start employing these practices wide scale we can eventually change the climate entirely for those regions in a positive way giving it more abundance, more heat mitigating potential. Remember, one of the, the major uh, things that, that reflects sunlight back up into the atmosphere or back up out of the, the um, out into space, uh, one of the things that, you know, the technical term is albedo, it's the amount of reflectiveness that the earth has. One of the things that increases that the most is water vapor in the form of clouds, like, like visible clouds. So you can start to imagine that if we're creating more, more water abundance in these areas and they're starting to create more clouds, we can have then a, a, a feedback loop where the clouds then reflect more of the heat. It lowers the harshness of that area. Things start to become more and more close to to temperate or you know first to be more like subtropical if we're talking about very very hot arid areas be more like um, closer to like a rainforest but then we can keep on going and we can make it so we can start to reverse the effects of climate change in in vast areas if we do this across enough of the planet it's, it's definitely possible that, that we can engineer things without having to put up aerosols into the air that, that may or may not have other um, health effects. Uh, without, I've seen schemes where they put up a bunch of mirrors in low orbit or these lenses that refract some of the, the sunlight away. Without having to dim the sun, basically, from our perspective, we can do things to reverse climate change um, and start pushing things back towards a more uh, moderate level um, if, as long as we do it on a large enough scale. Well, hello, Strin. How are you tonight? I never thought of clouds as being a good reflector. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you know what? I'm going to take a little side tangent for a moment. So after 9-11 happened, when they grounded all of these, these, they grounded planes across the country, 
uh, they they showed that. Here, I'll just I'll just start reading it for you. On the morning of September 11th, uh, 20, 2001, officials in the U.S. National Air Control Center couldn't make out what was happening at first. As controllers watched the the second plane crash into the World Trade Center, you know all the story. Uh, let's skip ahead a little bit. So anyway, they, they started locking down the airports across the country. And there's what it looked like. So it went from all of these flights to, hopefully we'll see this quickly. Yep. So this is, uh, we're getting towards, oh, to virtually nothing. Look at that. They virtually all disappeared because all these planes were grounded because they, they had to get control of the skies. And, it, and civilian air traffic didn't resume for three days. Thousands of jet aircrafts uh, leave contrails. Now, we're not going to get into the idea that this is somehow a conspiracy of chemtrails. That's, that's something totally different. It's, oh, thanks. Uh, what they are is contrails. They're, they're condensation caused from the engines mixing with you know, exhaust, and also being compacted by the, the, the jets, right, that produce those long trailing clouds in the sky. Now, usually, with so many aircraft over the United States doing that all at once, it does have an effect on the climate. It will reflect the sunlight back out into space. But after those three days, they saw a huge increase in, in temperatures. So, the, so this guy is arguing that the clouds created by contrails reduce the range of temperatures by contributing to cloud cover during the day they reflected solar energy that would otherwise have reached the earth's surface and at night they trap warmth that would otherwise have escaped this effect during these three days that the flights were grounded was strongest in poorest region or er, in most populated regions excuse me where air traffic was normally densest the increase in range came to about two degree two degrees celsius which is more like four degrees Fahrenheit. Just from that one thing, just so just from grounding all the planes, there, there were not those those clouds in the skies. And so you would have cooler temperatures during the day and you would have warmer temperatures during the night. So, yeah, clouds themselves can have a big effect on weather. Kind of cool, huh? But anyway, let's let's get back to the video and then we'll move, move along. Deeply wet soils can support trees and shrubs. Which <laughs> yes, in, in this small instance, a, uh, airplane travel does have a positive effect. Uh, it did guard against some amount of global warming. That, that's true. Of course, all the exhaust and the CO2 that they're putting out in the air kind of more than cancel that. But aside from that, yeah, that's cool. Which in turn can grow food. Yeah, two degrees in three days. That's a huge shift. A huge shift in average temperatures. Food, create habitat, block the wind, cast shade, produce firewood, attract bees with blossoms, and provide building materials. The protection that these trees provide causes less evaporation from the sun and wind. We can see at the urban scale at the house of Brad Lancaster in Tucson, Arizona, where he created a Sonoran Desert forest in the heart of the city using these rainwater harvests. Look at that just from changing the topography a little bit because it's not like he you know you saw those those ditches let me back up just a, a couple frames here uh, let's see look these are these are not significant ditches that he's he's building just a little bit like probably no more than than a couple feet deep you could you could dig that out with with hand shovels no problem and and for for all of, for that little bit of effort look at the abundance that he's created and that's the only change. It just allows the landscape to better use the water through these small changes to topography. It's one reason that, that the uh, swale and berm concept on, on, on contour, which we've talked about earlier, where you have a swale that, that stays at the same elevation, follows that elevation line all the way around the, the side of a hill, and then next to it you have a berm. Um, just doing that can have significant change long term to the amount of water that's available to plants. The ground stays wetter for longer and it feeds a cycle of rehydration. We start 
by planting the water high up in the watershed and working our way down. Big open water storages in the desert will have a lot of evaporation, but in the cool and cold temperate regions and wet tropics, large open storages of water can have huge benefits. A series of interconnected reservoirs can virtually drought-proof farms by storing enough water to last through prolonged dry spells. In the tropics, we find historic examples of how to maximize productivity and the edge as we get to the lower, wetter parts of the landscape. Mexico City is an ancient settlement location, and it's in a giant bowl surrounded by mountains where water doesn't drain. So the bottom was a huge swamp. The Aztecs built a vast network of islands called Chinampas. Ah, uh, yes, these are very cool. Uh, let's take a look at that real quick. We're going to come back to it later on in the series, more in depth, but just to give you an idea of what a Chinampa looks like. So look at what you have here. You see all of these, these wooden stakes. They basically just drive these posts down into the mud. And then in between it, they fill it with reeds and, and mud. And they just build it up layer by layer until it's above the water line. And then they just plant directly into it whatever crops you want. You can even do trees. Look, there are bunches of trees that are, are growing here. And it looks to me like they're at strategic positions to help hold up the wall with their deeper roots. And doing it this way, you, you ensure that your plants are always going to have access to water, access to nutrients, because there's going to be fish that swim in the different canals in between these, these chinampas. And uh, they, you know, through their waste, the waste water goes and filters through the reed beds and provides fertilizer up to the plants. So it's, 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 it really is a form of aquaponics. We've talked about aquaponics quite a bit on this channel, uh, the idea of using aquaculture, raising fish with hydroponics, growing food in an aqueous solution with, with, with nutrients fed to it through an aqueous solution. They were doing this like over a thousand years ago. Uh, pretty incredible. And they're even doing corn. Look, you can see on the, on the side over here, on the left side, they have corn growing in these chinampas. So it's not necessarily just your, your regular vegetable stuff. It's, it can be stuff that's very heavy feeding and, and requires a lot of maintenance, such as, as corn. It's pretty cool. And, and look here again, they're maximizing the edge effect. They're, they're um, valuing marginal land because the middle of a lake tends to be not the place that you even think about as a place to grow food. And, and they are also integrating rather than segregating. So they're, they're, they're using uh, and, they're, and they're valuing the edges as well and the marginal. So you have a lot of edge interaction between the, the dry land. You can see there's, there's even geese up on the middle there. Those could be another uh, source of food for you. Even if you don't eat the, if you're uh, squeamish about eating the animals themselves, they're still going to lay eggs, many more eggs than they ever could use. And it provides wonderful habitat for them. Uh, a lot more shelter, uh, a lot more sheltered areas for their offspring to, to grow up in. And as well as they can come in then and, and eat some of the things like slugs off of your plants. So that's, that's really what integrate rather than segregate is all about. It's about using these systems to benefit one another. And it's pretty cool. I agree. This is, this is really cool stuff. And we'll get in more into depth into this in, in a later video coming up. But, but for now, I just want to show you that because it's just so cool. And we could do that pretty much any place there's a lake. You know, any place there's a lake and also a place that, that grows any kind of reeds on the, on the sides of it or, or some sort of aquatic plant in abundance. We do chinapas, no problem. Where they dug down canals in the muck and piled it up on the rafts, which were then planted and took root. To this day, the chinampas in Mexico City are productive gardens which help feed the city. The canals are the transportation and the fish can be caught in them too. Every time a canal is cleaned out, the mud and muck are piled on to fertilize the chinampas. Wetlands have a natural capacity as filters because we find wetlands low down in the watershed. Where do they do chinampas, you're asking, Strin? They, they did it uh, primarily in Mexico City. Uh, well, present day Mexico City. Um, was it Tenochtitlan? Was that the, the, the historic name of it? Let me, let me just fact check myself there. 
So it was called, yeah, Tenochtitlan. And, and look at this. Here's a map of ancient Tenochtitlan. Look at this. Look at all these canals that go through the entire city. It's incredible. And they had these causeways, you know, these, that's, that's what's shown in, in brown here. These, these long roads that, that stretched out across the land so that they could have trade routes. But look at all these canals. It's just incredible. And then, and then you have islands that were joined together by the canals. Pretty cool. All in the middle of this giant lake. Oh, I don't know why it keeps doing that. And here's the, the central core of the city on, on the biggest island. Where they had the, the largest structures and stuff like that. Pretty amazing, the, the sort of lifestyle they had. And they're used to filtering everything coming down. So we use this fact to our advantage when creating our own wastewater treatment systems. These are also known as, as living machines or, or green machines. The idea being that you see all the, the different basins you have there. Each of those things has a different function. So you have a place where the, the, the solids get separated out and then they get filtered one way to be used by, by plants that are, are equipped to, to take up that level of nutrition. Um, and then you, you have the, the liquids that go to a different way, maybe through a reed bed or, or something like that. They get filtered out um, all the nutrients from that. And, and the point is by the end of the system, you come out with basically clean water. It's not going to be potable water. It's still going to have a, a level of, of bacteria in it, but much less filtration would be needed to then recirculate it back into the community. Or you could just put it straight out to irrigate agricultural crops or, or whatever. Constructed wetlands, gray water systems, and living machines are all types of biological treatment that you can read about in the links. We build artificial wetlands to handle our wastewater and use the bio... Yes, and, and on, that, on that note as well, Strin, I think one of the other main reasons that, that Mexico City was built in the middle of the lake uh, was because it's very defensible that way. You know, you basically have these thin causeways that, that are the only ways in and out of the city. It's hard to march an army down there, uh, especially since lakes are flat. You can see for a great distance, you're going to be able to see the army coming and make provisions for it. So I think that's another reason too. But definitely the Chinampas were one of the reasons that they had so much military strength in the region. That's, that's also true because they were able to just grow so much abundance for their people biology of healthy soil and aquatic plants to break the bonds and absorb pollutants. Water is life. Water is sacred. We must protect the water and use permaculture design to replenish and clean water and restore a healthy hydrological cycle. Water flows from mountains to rivers is through a watershed in the shape of a tree. Water falls on the land and forms the headwaters of streams. These streams come together with other streams and combine to form creeks and eventually rivers in the trunk of the tree. When those rivers meet the ocean, they spread back out like roots where estuaries enter a water body. It's important to understand where your site is located on this watershed tree. If you're located by a major river at the trunk of the tree, then you have a lot of land above you, with possibly large amounts of water draining off that land and soils being deposited in the valley bottoms. If your site is high in the watershed, you're dealing with smaller flows of water and more shallow soils, which have eroded over time to fill in the valleys below. Every location within the watershed has its assets and liabilities. One is not better than the other, but you would employ different strategies in uplands, lowlands, mountains, foothills, and valleys. So first, you need to understand where you are within the watershed tree. It's also important to understand the entire landscape is made up of watersheds. The ridges and high spots divide watersheds and each watershed becomes a unit of management. This is because what happens in the upper part of the watershed affects what happens down below. 
the parts of the watershed are connected because water runs from the top. So I feel like this might be something that we should look up as well, just to get a better visualization of what watershed actually, what watersheds actually look like. Because, I mean, it's a fair illustration, but it's, it's another thing to see an actual map of it. So here's just a, a general watershed map of the entire United States. Oh, there's Europe for you. So look at that. It's, it's basically like you said, you have these, these uh, dividing lines, all these ridge lines, and then you have water sheds that, that are uh, broken up by these various ridge lines, and they come out. Um, he says it's like a tree. I don't think they tend to, usually water tends to concentrate more and more as it goes downhill into larger and larger, you know, bodies of water till you get to a river size, and the river tends to flow to a sea or a, a large lake or something like that. Look at that. There's the Amazon right there for you. Look at all of the land that, that's drained by that single watershed. That's why the Amazon is, is so abundant with water. That's just, I mean, that's, that's most of the, the, the country of Brazil right there, is that singular watershed. That's why the Amazon River puts out more water than, than any other river in the entire world. That's just incredible. And then we can see the U.S. right here. Look at all that's drained just by the, the Mississippi and Missouri watersheds. So you have the Missouri, which is actually the longest uh, finger, the longest tributary of the Mississippi. It starts way out in Montana, comes all the way through North and South Dakota, all the way down uh, till it meets up finally with the Mississippi in like the border of Illinois and, and Missouri. And then from there, it, it flows down further to uh, Louisiana and out to sea. But look how much of the country is drained by that singular watershed. Uh, it's just incredible. Show Norway. Oh, okay. We'll go back up to Europe again. Look at all the different watersheds that are within Norway. That's really broken up. And I would, I would bet you that's due to the glaciers carving such deep valleys. So pretty, I would bet you each of these is dominated by a few glaciers that, that then go out to the sea. But look at look at on that that one so the left hand side of the ridge there, or the western side. Very tiny watersheds. So many of them. You can really see where the, the mountains run in any given country just by looking at the watersheds as well. It's kinda cool. Yeah, I mean that that just goes to show how much our lives are affected by the way that water flows. I mean that that I mean, you know, if you're someone living over here in like Ecuador, um, uh, let's see, that's probably, I'm not sure exactly what countries, but you could be in an entirely different country and, and still be in the same watershed as, as, as Brazilians. Um, it's pretty incredible how much that really connects people together. So things that you do in these countries over here uh, you have like Peru and Ecuador and up into like Colombia, Venezuela. People from many different countries can affect the water quality of people living in Brazil. Just by mismanaging it at the headwaters, you could cause a whole ripple effect all the way down the line. So, I mean, that's one reason that, that borders are rather silly because environmental catastrophes don't respect borders. Um, they, they just keep rolling on because it's just cause and effect, really. Uh, let's get back to the, the video there. Top to the bottom. So what happens upstream has consequences downstream. Yeah, those fjords, they're basically these, these fingers that come straight from the ridge down to the, the, the coastline. Not much land spread. And I think that, that, has to, that would have to have... Um, been caused by these these massive glaciers just depressing the land and, and carving it out little by little i remember i had some geography teacher one time and and he was like you know people ask me what's the worst natural disaster and and they say oh is it an earthquake is it a volcano and i'm like no it's a glacier because no matter what you do you cannot stop a glacier it it will just keep pushing forward so if the glacier comes up to your front door of your house you better just move because there's no amount of effort you can you can muster that's going to change the course of that glacier. It's just way too massive. So yeah, I, I would assume that that's the reason for, for such 
um, such a fing like a, a, a finger like effect uh, to to take place in those watersheds. Pretty cool. For example, if you collect water up here, then you can use gravity to feed it anywhere down below. If you remove all the vegetation up here, then soil and water will quickly cascade off the land. It could cause flooding down below. So it's really important to understand where you are located within the watershed tree when you're taking the time to figure out where you are and what forces are working on your site. Your design should unfold effortlessly. One of the main design flaws of Western civilization and colonial expansion is the imposition of a grid over the landscape. The Romans originally used urban grids as a way to assert militarily control over their conquered lands. And the grid has been the way we divide land ownership ever since. But let's look at what happened when we superimpose this grid over nature's property boundary, the watershed. If you own this square and your neighbor owns that square and they decide to pave it over and build a used, a used car dealership, then there are some serious issues of excessive stormwater and pollution runoff coming onto your property because each, pit, each piece of this grid is viewed independently and not seen as part of an interconnected system. So let's and, and that really also depends on, on where you are. If you're, you're out in the, the western part of the United States, they have much stricter water rights rules. So it may very well be, be that being upstream, you do have extra water rights as compared to your neighbors downstream. Uh, so, but, but it definitely is true what you said, that, that what you do in one section of a watershed can, can affect all the rest of it. So that, that's, that's definitely an important thing to take away. Yeah, the glaciers actually caused the land to sink a bit, and now that they are melting, the sea level in certain areas of Norway is actually uh, appearing to be lower. Yeah, I, I heard about that. There's these, these fishing villages in Norway where it, it used to be that they were fishing villages right next to the water, but because of the, the, the glaciers melting, the, the land is popping up, basically. Uh, and so now they, they can be you know, 50, 100 feet away from the water, and they're, they're getting really upset about that, uh, which I would too. Know, got to reorganize your whole village just because of um, of the effects of climate change. That's that's pretty cool, or not cool. That's that's pretty amazing, really. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Strin. Look at our watershed map again and talk about what happens when we deforest the upper watershed. More than fifty percent of a tree is made up of water, so if you think about it. A forest at the top of a mountain is basically a lake of water. Water. It's basically a natural form of catching and storing energy, storing it high on the land and, and letting it slowly uh, get filtered out, usually through, like I said, evapotranspiration. But, but yeah. Water's transpired and then joins with cloud water in the atmosphere, and that forest acts like a giant sponge absorbing rainfall as it slowly seeps down through the watershed. When we clear cut the forest and remove that sponge, the water no longer has all that vegetation with its roots and rich soil to slow it down and allow it to soak into the ground. The water can race quickly and erode soil down through the watershed. So when we remove- And that can cause all kinds of problems for uh, not only people, but wildlife down downstream from that. Uh, a lot of fish determine or, or depend on a certain clarity of water to, to do things like spawn and, and find their prey and, and that sort of thing. A lot of aquatic plants uh, depend on a certain clarity of water. So if you're having a lot of erosion happening every time that it rains, that can, that can add a lot of mud to the water and, and it can... Uh, it can cause like dead spots basically within a, a river streams water uh, water flow um, because of, of, of so much just just changing the the clearness of the water can have a big effect move the vegetation we change the duration it takes for the water to get from the top of the watershed to the bottom of the watershed 
where before it may have taken a drop of water one year to get from the top to the bottom of the system. In a degraded landscape, it may take only a week or just days or hours. With all that water moving so quickly, much less water absorbs in, water tables drop, springs dry up, vegetation can't survive, and desertification can occur. So let's, uh, let's think about, let's go back to that picture real quick. So let's look at our water. Springs dry up, desertification. So thinking about how things are laid out, um, how would having a, a more of a leftist society change this sort of a thing? Um, I, I think if you're talking about any form of leftism, you probably have your ethics rooted in something like egalitarianism and democracy and as, as much fairness as possible to all of everybody, all the, the, the citizenry of, of whatever region or geopolitical um, set aside you're, you're talking about. So in the current system with, with capitalism, they, they tend towards an individual's right to do whatever they want with, with their land. It's a, it's a certain form of rights that people on the right love to talk about. Individual freedoms to do one thing or another without consequence and without anyone being able to tell them no. But of course, as we see here, that's, that's a very narrow focus on, on the, the, the issues that can arise from that sort of thing. If you say, I own this land, I'm going to clear cut all of it, that can have devastating effects on all of your neighbors. So someone on the right would say, well, it's, it's my right to do with my land what I want. And, but someone on the left would say, we need to balance your right to use your land with the rights of everyone else to have clean water or, or be free from flooding dangers. I mean, that's, a, that's a major problem as well. It's not just that stuff erodes quickly and that's, that's not good for agriculture. It degrades the soil. This is what causes flooding. Um, and especially if you are in a city that's, that's in a river valley, the things that happen upriver really affect you. So if we're talking about more of a, a, a egalitarian society where we're, you know, we're balancing people's rights one and another, we have to think about these issues of water rights. And we can't just say that, that even if a, a, an entire city collectively owns all of their land, it still wouldn't be okay for them to do something that could have adverse effects to everyone else that lives on that watershed. Um, in a book I was reading recently, it's called The Fifth Sacred Thing. Uh, it's by Starhawk. Got some like hippy dippy woo stuff in there, but I didn't, I didn't mind that too much. And it, it was really organic and, and felt integral to the plot. But anyway, they would, they would speak about rather than their city or their region or their state or anything, they would talk about things in terms of watersheds. And the more you look at, at, at water rights and water issues, the more that becomes clear of why it's important to start thinking in that way. What is it that, that I can or cannot do uh, to affect my land or the land that I have access to? That, that uh, What are the consequences that it might have to other people on that same watershed? These are things that, that you know, societies that try to balance rights really need to start thinking about and really need to start talking about. Another issue with the, the idea of land rights and that sort of thing is if you are allowed to use your land any way you so choose, um, you, may, you may use it in a way that is harmful to the land, like, like you may just decide to, to salt all of your soil for whatever reason. You don't want anything to grow. You don't want to have to mow anything. I mean, whatever your, your rationale is. And you may not be on, on a significant part of the watershed. It may not affect anyone else. But no one owns their land forever. At some point, your little plot of land is going to pass into other hands. So we also have to think into the future when we're talking about rights to use land. You, you shouldn't be able to damage your land so much that... that no future generation can use it. 
because then eventually it's just going to take this piece of land out of out of commission, this piece, this piece, so on and so on, until there's no place left for people to go. Um, let's see what you say. Yeah, imagine if we use science to help structure our society. I think that's very important. Soil science, watershed science, these sorts of things are, are very important when looking at the at, at how things are. It is up to us as leftists to bridge that gap between is and ought. Uh, you know, in, in philosophy, that's that's one of the great questions. How do you bridge the is ought gap? You can describe the world as it is, but there's no way that you can describe it that's going to tell you how it should be, right? You can say climate change is happening, but if you're not someone who cares about that, if you don't give a damn about future generations, you just want to squeeze as much out of, out of your personal life as you possibly can, you don't care about your kids, you don't care about future generations, there's no amount of science and, and showing the world as it is that is necessarily going to change your mind. It depends on you having a care for things to then say, well, this is how it ought to be, right? If you care about future generations, then you can say, knowing how the world is, this is what we ought to do. And so science can tell us all of that is quest all those is questions. But we have to rely on, on our own personal philosophies um, and really our own emotions to determine how things ought to be at least in our own minds, and then make arguments for that. You may be able to, to sway people's minds. They maybe just haven't thought about things deeply enough, or they didn't realize that they really do care about things. But if at their core, they don't care about something, like they just don't care, they're, they're, maybe they're just a, a, a psychopath, I guess. It's, it's not an actual psychological term, but it, it, it's useful enough. Someone who just cannot experience empathy or has very shallow emotions cannot really care about the plight of others. It doesn't matter what arguments you use. Um, they, they, may, they may just not care. Conversely, if someone doesn't think they care about a certain issue, if you get down far enough to their core beliefs and you find that, yeah, they really do care about leaving something good for future generations, they don't want their kids to live in a hell world, right? And, and that's going to be the case for at least 90% of people, I think, uh, I think uh, the, the, the average amount of, of people that, that really lack empathy is, is somewhere between like 5 and 10% of the population, of any given population. So for the vast majority, people are going to care a little bit. You just have to get to that core somehow. So you say, oh, you really do care about your, your, your grandson's ability to grow up in a world where, you know, they can survive and thrive. If you can get to that point, then you can start giving these ought sort of prescriptions or at least ideas. You know, you don't have to be forceful about it. But you can start saying, if you really want things to be good for your grandson or, or, your, or you know, even your, your son or daughter or whatever, your children, um, maybe we should start thinking about doing things in a different way, in a way that's, that's more fair for everyone so that everyone can have a shot at that. Because guess what? Everyone else, virtually everyone else who has children, grandchildren, or just people they care about is going to want something better for, for future generations and even for themselves. Um, so if everyone wants that, it, you know, just thinking I'm going to get it at the expense of everyone else, if everyone thinks that way, it ends up being at the expense of everyone, right? We have to then re reframe it and say, you know, we have to be fair or as fair as we can be about opportunities, about uh, people's ability to, to live and thrive in society, their ability to make these most, most contributions as they, they possibly can, live their highest and best selves. And if we want that, it, we should be doing away with ideas that there needs to be hierarchies because hierarchies mean that someone necessarily loses, you know, and, and with the way a capitalist hierarchy works, you're going to have the majority of people losing to a, a degree or another. That's not to say that you couldn't have a, a capitalist society, because we've had it before, where there's a robust middle class and, and, you know, 
there there still is the the lower class that that's not doing well but but by and large the people that are paying attention to politics and stuff are doing okay but we could do even better we could have even more people doing well if we move towards these sort of philosophies so i think that really has to be your 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 focus and your aim just saying this is how it ought to be starting with that um, just saying this is how things are and expecting people to fill in the dots. I don't think either of those strategies are, are really productive in the long run. You know, you have to appeal to people where they're at and you have to communicate with them in ways that they understand. Um, without condescension, I would say, without, you know, a whole lot of judgment and, and, and whatnot. If you really care about them being better as a person, you have to treat them as a person who can be better, first and foremost. And to do that requires a bit of empathy, a bit of, of trying to imagine yourself as them, and a bit of listening to them as well about what they say their concerns are. You know, And, and that might take translation. They may not be able to articulate their concerns. A lot of people don't, they have a vague notion of, of what they're concerned about, what they care about in life, but they maybe don't have the time or energy or, or the opportunity to, to really articulate that and that can be a place where you can come in and, and, and help them with that so that's how i view um leftist politics kind of mapping onto all of this stuff but a watershed might be a good place to start with that and land might be a good place to start with that as well if you can get people to understand that well, well maybe i wouldn't want my neighbor to damn that that stream if it means that my land becomes parched maybe i wouldn't want my neighbor to shoot every single deer that crosses their their uh, fence line because then I wouldn't have anything to hunt left. Then you can say, oh, well, it sounds like you want to start managing people's rights in proportion to each other so that your right to do X ends when it infringes on current or future generations ability to do the same or similar, um, right? Or infringes on some other right of, of current or future generations. I think that's a, a, a reasonable way to, to balance rights out. Um, so it's just a matter of getting down to what does that really mean? You know, how then should we manage wildlife or water rights or, or uh, one's ability to, to use a certain piece of land? And that's, this is not just for the country as well. This is for urban areas as, as well. So putting up water on the stock market for speculation be not a good thing. I would agree. Yeah. Water needs to be completely decommodified. I, um, in this book again, and, and I, I do highly recommend it. I, in fact, I will get up a picture of it now. It's one of my favorite illustrations I've ever seen. I've, I've, li I've loved this illustration even before I really knew what the book was. Now this one image has driven a lot of my thoughts and a lot of my feeling really for, for quite some time. So this is an illustration of, of the city of San Francisco. Uh, this is after climate change has, has ravaged things. Uh, the, the, the ozone layer has been depleted, so people can't really be out in the sun too long. Um, the, the bay has been poisoned by, by petrochemicals and stuff like that. But these people have held on. They, they had this, this, this leftist revolution. Uh, and it basically is an anarchist society. Like they, they don't ever call it that specifically, but they do mention Marx. They do mention um, some leftist philosophy in the book as, as being foundational to their city. They have councils that, that meet. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily all direct democracy, but, but basically anyone can participate in these, these various councils. There's a water council, there's a defense council, there's a toxics council, technology council, all these sorts of things. Basically, anyone can, can be a part of it as, as long as they are, you know, willing to get along with the other people in it and, and work towards the same goals. So this society that they have set up, uh, they've, they've used as much eco-friendly technology as they can manufacture themselves. So they have a, a few solar panels on rooftops. And basically, they've taken the streets. You can see over on, on the right-hand side there. They've taken the streets, and since no one really has or very few people have cars anymore because the petroleum industry has basically gone belly up. There's still a few electric cars. There's still a few like alcohol powered cars where they, they use plant-based alcohols to, to um, 
to power them, but, but it's mostly for transportation of, of farm goods from, you know, further reaches beyond the city. So they've taken the streets and they've, they've turned them into these, these gardens. They've used permaculture principles. They've um, taken basically every square inch of the city that they possibly can and put it under glass for a greenhouse to, to grow things in the colder seasons. Um, not that San Francisco ever gets all that cold, but, but still. And they have rooftop gardens. They have just basically every, there's, there's abundance everywhere you can see. They've also taken all of the, the uh, waterways, the, the little streams that, that naturally run through the peninsula of San Francisco, and they've done what's called daylighting, where they, they tear up the streets, they, they tear down buildings if they have to, although I would assume they would want to preserve their building stock because it's, you know, with their limited resources, they don't have much to fall back on to, to build new housing stock. But, but anyway, they do their best to do what's called daylighting these streams. So streams run through the streets. Uh, streams run their natural courses. And consequently, everyone has access to water. And they've called uh, the, the four basic elements, uh, earth, air, water, and fire, sacred things, something that nobody can own and everyone has a right to. That's kind of the, the core basis of their society. The fifth sacred thing being the spirit um, or, or human spirit in, in, in both its spiritual sense and, and it's just, you know, emotional sense, right? Um, so it's, it's a really cool book. It, they, they lay out a very interesting take on, on how an anarchist society could function um, and function well, even in the face of, of catastrophic climate change. Uh, yeah, it's given me a lot to think about, but I've, I've always loved this image in particular. This, this to me just shows what permaculture applied to, um, city living, to, to an urban space, to, to new urbanist ideas could accomplish. So I've, I've for a long time wanted to put together new urbanism and permaculture ideas to make a permaculture city. And, um, to my surprise and delight, I, I found that the, the, the source material for this also adds that, that third element that I've been talking about, leftist politics, the leftist political organization of the city. And I think that's really the, the glue that holds everything together and, and makes it all work. And, you know, they, they have no homelessness. They have changed a lot about um, what, what family structures are, are common or allowed. Um, they, they've basically fulfilled a leftist revolution and and all of its promises um and of course the big conflict in the book is that they're being menaced by the, the last vestiges of, of capitalism coming up from the southlands uh still have extreme hierarchies where you know rich people have their own private swimming pools that that uh poor people are not allowed to even look at let alone draw water from well the rest of the world or the rest of the, the poor people, which constitutes most people, are forced to have water rations that they have to wait in long lines for, um, or they're forced into the army and, and given these uh, immuno boosters because there's also these plagues that have ravaged humanity again and again. So they're given these immuno boosters, um, which keeps them in line because they, the idea is if they ever get off them, then their immune system goes into shock. Um, it's, it's like with certain drugs, how it, it overproduces a certain hormone in your, your brain. And then if you go off it, you, your hypo, whatever that, that um, endorphin is, and it can really have catastrophic effects on your mind. It's the same sort of idea, only it's with your immune system. So that's how they keep people in the army and, and in check. Um, really interesting book. And it has a lot to say about uh, leftism and, and, and spirituality and uh, culture and... And, and permaculture as well, um, and, and what we're all facing. It's a really good work of speculative fiction. So highly recommend that one. Uh, so basically, utopia. Yeah, and then that's how it, it's, it's kind of funny how whenever this, this one main character who's gone from San Francisco to the Southlands to, to share her healing abilities with everybody, uh, you know, there's, there's pockets of resistance in, in the, the hills around, like, L.A. and stuff like that. So every time she tells someone about her city, they're like, oh, wow, that sounds like a utopia. And she's like, no, no, it's not. It's like, you know, to her, it's just the way that things are. Um, and it's not a utopia. They, they, they have a lot of scarcity in terms of, of water. 
Um, they still have a lot more abundance than a lot of people left over. Uh, but they don't have things like police forces. Basically, if you just cannot get along in society, they, they get together and they, they grab you as they're very community minded. So it's not just like, oh, you, someone do something about it. People just naturally do stuff together. So if someone is just like being very violent, can't get along, um, they're basically thrown out of society and they go and live in the, in the hills around San Francisco with the wild boar people, you know, all the, all the outcasts. Um, so yeah, I mean, it is, it is very much a, a utopic vision, but it's not perfect. And, you know, one of the flaws that, that they explore is that when it came to deciding how they were going to go ahead, um, and secure their future, they could decide to do arms manufacturing and build up a military and, and like real defenses, or they could put all of their efforts into cleaning up environmental messes around them and growing food and as much abundance as they can muster. And they chose the latter, which led them open to invasion from people that don't have those same ethics and standards, which, yeah, I uh, don't want to spoil it too much, but, you know, they, they really come into conflict. They come close to ruin from the invading forces from the South, the, the capitalist armies. Um, so, yeah. Interesting, anyway. Cuba is literally closer to achieving this than we are. That's, that's absolutely true. And in, interestingly enough, Cuba has done it for much of the same reasons that, that um, the people of this imagined San Francisco have as well. Uh, because of things like uh, trade embargoes, uh, they've, they've had to do things like repair cars endlessly, what cars are left over are from like the 1970s. They've had to learn concepts of permaculture. They have a whole lot of, of urban farms and, and gardens that have, have popped up since the embargoes were put in place. Um, they have, they've faced for scarcity and you know what, for all of their flaws and they do have the, you know, Cuba is by no means a perfect country. Uh, they're, they're not as open and, and free of a society in, in many ways as, as places like the U.S. are. Like, you don't have as much ability to criticize the government. You don't have as much ability to have control over um, politics and stuff like that. But what they do have is no homelessness. What they do have is nobody going hungry. Um, they, it's been taken to the limit, thanks to COVID, but that's been a stress around the world. They're, they're not unique in that. Um, and what they also have is some of the best health care in the entire world. Uh, and it's free to everybody. And I believe education is free to everyone as well. So they, they very much have taken this sort of an approach, maybe with a tighter grip on, on government than, than this is presented in this book. But still, you got to give them credit where credit's due, I would say. Yeah, you, you, you try to explain that to supporters of capitalism all the time, Strin. Uh, because of communist principles, we will never build up a military large enough to combat against the capitalist armies. That, that, that is, is not necessarily wrong. Like, uh, the USSR had a pretty big military for a while, but I, I, you know, I haven't studied it all that well, what, what caused the collapse of the USSR, but I would bet that, that, overextension into military endeavors had something to do with it. Um, but because capitalism can <laughs> concentrate all this wealth and power at the top and everyone else just basically has to go along with it, they can afford to put money into military rather than things like healthcare, especially in my country. Uh, they can put money into military instead of, um, a lot of things, a lot of social problems instead of housing. They can put money into police instead of housing. Um, they can put money into police instead of uh, transportation, a good functioning transportation, public transportation system. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's priorities out of whack, I would say, you know, very much paranoid about, uh, being the, the world's top power and, and really more than anything, using that military might to advance business interests around the world. 
um, and threaten other countries that, that would rival us in any way. Um, yeah, rather than just providing for the people right now, it doesn't seem like a good trade-off to me, which is one reason that I, I talk about all these ideas. I think we can do better. All right, I think that's enough of that tangent. Let's get back to the videos. Oh, it looks like I only got about 15 minutes left to stream tonight. I'm going to try real hard to be done at 9 o'clock because, you know, I got work tomorrow. But we'll keep going. can occur. So here we are back at the watershed again. When we deforest the upper watershed, we have loss of soils above and flooding down below. So understanding where you are in the watershed will tell you what kind of events and conditions yeah. you need to design for and where you need to start to improve your conditions. In much of the temperate world, there's this amazing creature who performs the function. Uh, you say that uh, at least at first to achieve communism, we would need that large army. But once it's achieved and capitalism is stomped out of every corner in the world, then we could really focus on the people and the land. And yeah, and that was more or less the, the, the position of the places like the USSR. They, they tried their best to, to build up their military might in order to fight against um, insurrections within their country from the old capitalists and uh, resist powers such as the U.S. trying to meddle with them around the world. Um, they, I guess they just couldn't quite keep it going long enough to, to get to that uh, more utopian point, I guess. Um, but yeah, and, and especially in places like the U.S., there's, there's no way that any sort of insurrection would ever work without backing of a significant chunk of the military. It's just not going to happen. Our military is way too powerful. So, yeah, uh, if that's going to be your, your, the, the route that you go, the idea of, of having a, a military insurrection, yeah, you would definitely have to get the actual military on your side first if that was ever going to succeed. Not to say that's necessarily impossible, but, um, yeah, it's food for thought, I guess of watershed engineer, and that's the beaver. The beaver builds dams in the waterways and slows the flow of water, trapping sediments and filling the watersheds with sponges that slow and sink the flow. That's what the watershed looked like when European colonization happened, and as Europeans moved across this continent, they hunted and trapped the beaver at every turn. There were so many beaver in every valley across this continent, their pelts were actually used as currency. But when the beaver were removed, the watershed and ecosystem were never the same. The speed at which the water flows through the watershed is accelerated and the land is more dehydrated because of it. But as permaculture practitioners, we can take on the function of the beaver and restore the hydrologic cycle to enhance the health of the entire ecosystem. You may have noticed that OSU's mascot is the beaver. This seems a fitting emblem to me. So in order for us to take on the function of the beaver and restore the watersheds, we need to start at the top. When we slow water at the top and work our way down, then we slow water at each step along the way and rehydrate the landscape. If we begun at the bottom of the watershed, we would, need, we would need to build massive structures to intercept the swift and powerful flow. But when we start at the top of the watershed, smaller structures will do the job to slow, sink. Yes, uh, OSU is Oregon State University, and that's where Andrew Millison, our speaker here, is, is from. That's where he teaches. And spread the water. So in permaculture, we become the beavers, the watershed restorers. This is needed in Haiti and a thousand other places, and this is a very tangible way to restore the health of communities and the planet. If you haven't figured it out by now, trees are an essential part of the permaculture landscape. Not only do trees provide the many benefits already mentioned in this course, shade, mulch, wood, fruits, nuts, flowers, medicine and habitat, and not only do they provide the very oxygen we breathe and stabilize the soil, but trees also play an important role in bringing rain to the land. 
Evapotranspiration from forests is part of the process by which moisture moves in the atmosphere, and forests promote rainfall as forests soak up rain and then release that water back into the atmosphere to condense and precipitate downwind. When trees are cut, rainfall is decreased. The integration of trees in the permaculture landscape is essential for climatic, economic, and environmental reasons. Founder Bill Mollison recommends at least 20 to 30 percent of a permaculture landscape is dedicated to trees for windbreak and forage. When you think about it, the surface area of a tree, every leaf is a mini solar collector. I mean, literally, literally leaves collect the sun's energy and, and through chemical processes turn it into available food for the tree. So he's not just doing a turn of, of, of phrase for a turn of speech, whatever you call it. The canopy is a filter for dust and windborne nutrients as well and a cushion to break the fall of raindrops so they don't erode the soil. So as we can see, trees are actually these multifunctional dynamic accumulators of energy here in the landscape. Strategies for food production vary greatly between the major climate zones. There are some themes that are constant for all climates. One of those is the use of locally adapted varieties of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and domestic animals. This places permaculture solidly in opposition of fact. Uh, sure, Spitfire 3666. We can always talk politics, uh, especially if you can integrate it into the stuff we're, we're learning about today. Um, how do you feel that your, your personal politics uh, map onto things like permaculture? I'd be interested to know that factory farming and the use of genetically modified plants and animals, where only one variety of plant or animal is mass produced and agriculture is homogenized over wide regions. Remember that diversity is resilience. And the permaculture approach is to value genetic diversity and support the living evolution of food crops that are suited for the unique conditions of each area. In drylands, Food production centers around the development of oases, where water and nutrients are concentrated from expansive areas into... All right, Spitfire, your question is that, is there any better alternative to capitalism? I think there absolutely is. Um, if you think the, the best form of economy is one where uh, a, a small handful or, or even singular people can make all the decisions for an entire industry, or I mean, excuse me, an entire business, and that the workers should have little to no say in, in the goings-on of, of things like um, even things as simple as safety, workplace safety, uh, scheduling, um, benefits, uh, things like uh, health care and, and time off, uh, maternity, paternity leave, if they should have no say in uh, compensation, uh, if they should have no say in any sort of ethical decisions that the, the uh, business might find itself uh, having to, to make judgments on. If you think that's the best we can do, then um, I don't know what else to tell you. I, I, I totally disagree with that, though. I think we can have more democracy in the workplace. I think we can have people who perform the services and, and produce the, the products for a business, uh, uh, the, the lifeblood of the business itself, the, the only reason you can stay in business, I think those people can and, and deserve to have a, a greater seat at the table. Um, even beyond just being represented by, say, a union. Unions are great, but, but owning the means of production is better. Um, so yeah, those are just a couple of my thoughts. So yeah, I think there definitely are things. There are definitely systems better than capitalism. Capitalism is not the end of history. It's not as though we get to capitalism and we just you know dust our, our hands off and say, well, no need to really study history anymore because we made it, boys. We, we, we got the, the best of all possible worlds. That's not true of any system. That wouldn't be true if we got perfect communism or anarchy or socialism tomorrow. 
if we got any of those systems in, in like perfect, you know, theoretical to actuality mapping on one to one across the world, we could still do better than any of those. But we still have to get to a better place first, probably, to actually see unintended consequences that come up when we try to institute these systems. We can, you know, see that maybe some systems are more suited to one region versus another. You know, there's all these things that we don't really know yet until we try on more of a, a grand scale. Um, but yeah, we can definitely do better than capitalism. Of course we can. We can do better than any system. We, we, the only thing that limits us is, is our imagination and our ability to organize and, and, and actuate these sorts of systems. So, yeah. Sweden and the other Scandinavian countries also employ capitalism and have better living st conditions than the U.S. You're right. We could have a uh, social democracy. You know, that's, that's one step further than what we have in the U.S. right now. We could have robust social safety nets, things like uh, universal health care, like uh, strong and, and widespread union representation, lots of, of rights for workers. But guess what? Sweden can do even better. Sweden can rely less on imperialists uh, for the goods and services that, that keep their economy going. Sweden can have more direct democracy instituted at all levels of, of government. We can, Sweden could spread out power even further. They've done a lot better than a lot of Western, other Western or so-called Western countries. But that doesn't mean that they're at the end of history either. They can do better too. Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, are you advocating for the, the Swedish or Scandinavian model? Are you just saying that that's what we should do and then, and then we should do, you know, the old dust off and, and call it quits on, on studying history anymore? Because... I would say it's good to get to that point, but but we can still do better. <laughs> you know, Sweden's not a, a perfect utopia either. And we'll probably never get to a perfect utopia, but we can always get better. That's the thing. We can always progress. We can always have a, a more fairer, egalitarian um, society that, that uplifts every individual, right? Allows them to have their highest and best lives, allows them to make as many contributions as, as they uh, want to pursue to um, the world is at large or, or their local community or, or whatever. Um, they can always do better too. So you advocate for the Swedish model for now. So, so that would, would you be comfortable being called a, a social Democrat then? Um, be interested to know that one. Uh, I mean, I think that's fine. That's definitely a, a goal worth pursuing, especially for places like the U.S., which are way behind even, even countries like uh, the U.K., um, who also are horrible imperialists around the world, meddle in all kinds of foreign affairs. They shouldn't be. But at least they got universal health care, you know. Uh, at least they, I, they believe they still have better union representation. They definitely have a more representative form of government than we do. It better represents the people having proportional representation in the parliamentary system than, than our winner-takes-all sort of model that brings it down to the Coke and Pepsi of political parties um yeah there's always a, there's always another place we can go though but that, that's cool you can you can advocate for that so uh so the so Strin says there's still exploitation of the global south that has to be dealt with uh absolutely totally agree with that yeah and, and that's that's that unseen cost of of having these capitalist countries that are that are more progressive is they often rely for their cheap consumer goods and and um, global trade advantages on exploiting uh, less powerful countries for their resources, uh, making terrible trade deals with them, um, exploiting poor working standards, uh, on and on and on. So it's it's just just because a society itself might look really good, uh, it, w once you're inside it, you don't see all of the, the, the tendrils from that empire that stretch out into the world, especially a place like the UK, for sure. I mean, they've had, they were one of the largest empires ever on the face of the earth. They used to say the sun never sets on the British Empire. To an extent, that's still true because they still have ties to places like Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Um, I believe in, in New Zealand, it's still the highest court in the land is is the crown, you know. I think that might still be true of Canada as well. They may have gotten away from that finally, but they, they still have 
you know, and they still have their hand in, in a lot of countries' affairs around the world. Um, willing to try new ideas. Well, that's, I mean, that's all I ask for. Thank you very much for, for um, that. That's, that's, uh, that's a really worthwhile statement to make, and I, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad you're here, Spitfire, and I hope that I can expose you to some tantalizing and interesting new ideas that, that you might like to incorporate into your own worldview. Uh, the land of the people in the uh, in the the land and the people of the global south. Then the West gets mad when there's mass immigration. You can't have it both ways. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And, and we we destabilize places like uh, Nicaragua and Honduras. Um, a lot of Central America has been destabilized by the U.S. And then consequently, the 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 dreaded migrant caravans come up from these places because they're overrun with right-wing despotism with lawlessness um, where gangs t take up the slack in the power vacuum uh, yeah we, we've, we've created those conditions it's it's all our own problems coming back to haunt us as is always the case with foreign meddling you're never just going to destabilize an entire country and have no consequences oh and it's getting very close to nine o'clock I mean it is basically nine o'clock now uh, so there's a catch to global health care. I mean, there's a catch to everything. There's always a trade-off. What if someone is a lazy person and doesn't diet? That's their own personal choice. You believe in personal freedom, right? If they, if they uh, are lazy and they don't diet, should we just let them die? That seems pretty harsh. You didn't follow my dietary advice, so now you should die? I mean, there's people with plenty of congenital conditions, too. Um... That, you know, I, I know someone who has uh, a blood clotting disorder where, for instance, if, if she were to get COVID-19, even being vaccinated, she would run a, a very high risk of succumbing and dying. Should she be punished for, for that, for having a congenital uh, defect in the way her blood clots? I don't think so. There's people with all sorts of disabilities that, that are also not, not their fault at all. There's people with very slow metabolisms. You know, like me, I, I, I don't overeat constantly. I'm not just, you know, mowing down on, on stuff every minute, but I have a slow metabolism. I work a very strenuous job. I do landscaping. I, I pull weeds. I, I uh, put down sod. I, I do plantings of, of very heavy things all the time in the hot sun. And my body just wants me to be this shape. So there's a lot of judgment that goes into those sorts of assessments as well. There's plenty of people that no matter how much they eat, they, they will never gain a pound. Um, a sibling of mine, um, I know at least used to not have a, a great diet. You know, nachos, Burger King, you know, fast food all the time. Rail thin. Rail thin. Doesn't matter what, what you do. People have uh, just kind of equilibrium points that their body tries to set them at. Um, but he would never ever get criticized for his diet because there's not the, the you know the the expected effects of it that you can see outwardly. But still, just bring it back to the idea of these are human beings, and human beings should be okay to make their own choices. And even if it's choices that that might affect in some small way people negatively, that that. Something as, as, as basic as deciding what food you eat should still be your right, and we shouldn't punish you with death for making a decision that we disagree with. Um, would you say the same thing about smokers? Like anyone you see lighting up, if they get lung cancer, that's it? You just you wish death on them? I don't know. That, that seems like they could go down some really dark paths really quickly, where we are deciding who gets to be the moral and, and upstanding and righteous person and who gets to be fed to the wolves, basically, you know, left to fend for themselves. I don't like that. Guess what, though, too? With the private system of health care, you do pay for other people's choices. If it's something that's covered, even if it's because that person made a bad decision, you quote unquote, in their lifetime, if it's something you might have disagreed with, if the insurance company has to shell out tons of money, um, or even if they're, here's an even better example. People in the U.S. tend to spend 
the vast majority or, or have the, the vast majority of, of spending on health care uh, done at the, at, in the last like five years of their life. Um, because we've had advances in medicine where we can extend people's lives even for a year or two, even facing very uh, catastrophic things like stroke, heart attack, high blood pressure, all this stuff. These, these interventions that tend to happen at the end of people's lives tend to be the most costly, right? Just to, ex to, to extend another year or two out of people's lives. All of that cost, all of those decisions that those people may have made, maybe they, they didn't live a good life and, and now they're, they're, the consequences are finally catching up to them, right? Maybe they had that bad diet you're talking about. Now they're, they're, they're having a bunch of stuff covered through their health insurance. And if you're on that same plan, guess who ends up footing the bill? It's not going to be the insurance company directly. Uh, I mean, they may be the direct payout, uh, the, pay, the, the payer of, of the hospital bills, but that gets funneled back to you. I mean, that gets put back on you, your premiums, just like if you have car insurance. My insurance j literally just went up like a couple months ago because too many people in my area were getting into car accidents. I didn't do anything. I didn't move. I didn't have an accident or a claim of any kind. But because of other people's actions, my, my premium went up. Okay? So that, that you, you face the same sort of thing whether you're on a private system or a public system. So maybe that's not the right question to be asking or maybe not the right way to be looking at it. Okay, maybe the, the, the right way to be looking at it is, okay, so these people need help, and we're in a position to help them. Well, let's help them, because that's the humane thing to do. That's, that's you know, how a society should function, right? We should take care of each other, even if we disagree with, with individual decisions. You know, that's what I think. Yeah, yeah, the, that, you put it very well there, Strin. So people don't inherently have the right to live? I think they do. Spoiler alert. Um... Yep. Oh, and, and Spitfire, I, I don't allow links in the chat. You are able to whisper links to me and I can decide whether to put it up. But just to protect the community from spammers that like to come in here, I don't allow links in the chat. <laughs> You're just over three reaction over these reactions. Oh, yeah, no problem. Uh, whisper, you, you go to the person's um, account and it's, it looks like an inbox or something like that. Um, and then you just whisper to them. It's, 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 it's a direct message. It's like a direct message on, on Twitter. Um, or Facebook. It's, it's just through this system instead. Trillions and trillions of, of dollars in the hands of a few people with over 7 billion people uh, are at the best paycheck to paycheck. But yeah, let's talk about your tax dollars. Yeah, I agree. And again, I think we can come up with a better system than, than one that exploits most of humanity for the benefit of, of the very few. I think we can have everyone live a, a good life you know, at least a life that they can be proud of. But that can only happen if we structure things to be more equitable, more de democratic, um, and and tear apart the structures that, that allow for uh, structural hierarchies that are unjust and, and only enrich the people at the very top. I think I'm not going to finish this video because I, I want to, I just got to get to bed. Uh, there's no two ways about it. But we will we will pick this up later on. We're about halfway through our playlist now, but little by little, that's the point, little by little, we're, we're working our way through, and my hope is that by the end of this whole playlist, you guys will have a pretty good idea of, of what permaculture is, um, who its major players are, who the major philosophies, or what the major philosophies are, and, uh, and some ways you can apply it to your own life and your own ways of thinking. But uh, we'll, we'll end it right there for now. If you guys have any one that you want me to raid to, now's the time to uh, pipe up and, and, and tell me who you want me to, to raid into. Otherwise, I'll just uh, pick from my own uh, list of, of people that I, I follow, which is awesome. So glad to hear you say that. I'm glad it's exciting you like it's been really animating my thoughts for, you know, basically when I first found out about it. It's been about, I think it was about 2005. I'm pretty sure that was my first exposure to permaculture at all. So we'll do Pinko the Bear. He's just playing a video game too, but that's fine. Awesome leftist comrade. But here we go with Pinko the Bear. Thank you all for joining me tonight. Uh, Lectam, until next time.